Hello and welcome again to my physical science online video lecture and lab supplement series. In today's video I wanted to do another lab walkthrough discussion and examples session. This one focuses on our acceleration lab. So let's take a look at what our instructions for today's lab tell us. Basically you're going to need some equipment for this lab. You'll need something that you can use as a ramp. You'll need something that you can roll down the ramp. You'll need some way to time the motion of the thing that's rolling down the ramp. You'll need a protractor so that you can set the angle for your ramp. And that's actually all that you really need. If you have a cell phone or video camera that you can use to video the motion of the object rolling down the ramp that you can then replay in slow motion, that actually will be pretty helpful for this experiment, although it's not strictly necessary. And last but not least, there is an Excel file that I provide you that you may use for this. So let's see what it is that we're doing in these instructions. First of all, here's the summary of the experiment. You're basically trying to get the acceleration of a ball which is rolling down a ramp. You need to be able to vary the ramp's angle of inclination because there's three different angles that you need to do this at. You are going to want something that when you roll the ball down the ramp it actually reaches the bottom without rolling off the ramp. So I've seen a variety of solutions, everything from like a gutter to a PVC pipe that's been cut in half so that the top is open uh, to just a simple board. And any of those should be okay as long as you can get the ball to roll down the ramp without rolling off the ramp. And you're going to need whatever ramp you're using to be a few meters long. I'd recommend about two and a half or three at the least. You're going to be beginning by putting some marks into the ramp and these have to be spaced in even increments. This is kind of tough to pick a good increment size because it turns out that the if you go too small then it's hard to actually time between them. But if you go too large, then the later increments, the ball is going to be moving very fast, and therefore you have the same problem of being able to time between two consecutive increments. You're going to need to make at least eight marks. So if this ramp is in 0.25 meter increment sizes, you're going to need at least eight marks in it. Uh, and, and those eight marks will give you at least a two meter long ramp. If you can get 10 to 12 marks that would be better and the even increments thing is helpful for being able to basically do this experiment, make your graph, etc. It's not a strict requirement in as much as you can still make this the graphs that you need without having even increments but when you get to the quiz it may ask some questions about how fast is the ball rolling and if you have it in even increments you can look at your graph or look at your data and make a rough estimate as to how fast the ball is rolling. If they're not in even increments then it's hard to compare how fast it is between two given marks to how fast it is between the next set of two marks. And here's where I put in the note about your cell phone video camera. Basically, if you have the ability to do this, I would set up your cell phone or other video camera to record the ball rolling down the ramp and then play it back in slow motion so that you can get an actual time mark as the ball hits each one of these little markers that you've put onto the ramp. If you don't have the video camera, what you end up doing is basically using a stopwatch and hitting the lap function as it passes each one of these markers. Now, as you know, it should take more time to get 
to the second marker than it took to get to the first marker. In other words, if it took one second from when you release the ball to get to the first marker, it cannot have arrived at the second marker in less than one second from when you release the ball. With that said, the increment size of time between two consecutive markers may actually be decreasing. In other words, it may get to the first marker after one second and the second one after one and an eighth seconds or, or one and seven eighths seconds or, or what have you. It depends on your marker spacing. So you're going to be doing this for three different angles of ramp and I've worked this out on, as an example at a 10 degree angle. So you're going to be duplicating this entire table but at one degree, two degree, and four degree. So what do those look like? Well I can draw that for you over on my drawing workspace. So your ramp basically is going to be set up something like this where the ground should be more or less level like this and your ball starts here at the top of the ramp you should be measuring this angle right here this angle right here we'll call theta theta is equal to one degree two degrees and four degrees for your experiment and then in my experiment which is the example included theta is 10 degrees and in fact the reason why I did a larger angle in my example than what I'm asking you guys to do in your experiment is that it's actually easier to time at smaller angles that's why I don't really go much above this four degree angle when you get to 10 degrees this ball actually can be moving pretty dang fast even four degrees you'll notice that it moves fairly quickly. So you have to have your eight increments, which may be like this, and so on. So here we have, I've actually marked out nine increments, but if you look on the example that I've included, not counting this initial one, which you can just write down zero because it's released from the position of zero. Uh, not counting that one, you'll see that there are in fact eight increments in the example that I've worked. And what I basically did was I released the ball from the top and then as I passed through each one of these points, I hit the lap function on my stopwatch. Or really what I did is I looked on the slow motion video and looked at what the time mark said when I started here and what it was at each of these points. So for the first trial, the first set of times as this thing rolled down the ramp, here's what I had. In other words, I started the video and then at the 0.75 second mark is when I basically released the ball. So looking at the frames, here are the time stamps for when the ball passed each one of the marks on my ramp. Okay, so you'll notice that the actual times that I record in my table are these blue times here. So how did I get from the red time to the blue time? Well, I released the ball after 0.75 seconds. So we could call that, for example, T1 or T0 prime. So these would represent the T primes and this is 0 0.75 seconds. These represent the t's. So if I was going to label these, these would be t prime and these would be t. And to get t, we basically use t sub i is equal to um, t prime sub i minus t0 prime. Okay, so as an example, to get to this one right here at 0.25 seconds, we would have t for 0 0.25 is equal to 1.25 seconds. That's this guy right here. 
minus 0 0.75 seconds. And so that gives us our T 0.25 of 0 0.50 seconds. Now note that this part of the example is useful for those of you who are actually using video recording and looking at timestamps to do this. If you're just using a stopwatch, then basically you can use the lap function as it passes by each of these marks and it should record the actual time that it passed each mark at. You may have to be careful though because it may, depending upon your watch, may actually time how long each lap lasts. So in other words, if you were to do this by stopwatch, what it would record is, again, this is zero, it put a 0.5 here, here it put 0.4, here it put 0.1, here it might put 0 0.12, 0 0.16, uh, 0 0.09, uh, this one would be 0 0.08, and this one would be 0 0.06. So if you did it with a stopwatch and it reported these times, what you would have to do is to get the blue, you'd have to add up all of the green times up to that point. So for this point 0.9, you would get T sub 50 is equal to T of the 0.25 prime plus t of the 0 0.50 prime. This one should be zero anyway because that's when you're starting your stopwatch. And so you'd have 0 0.50 seconds plus 0 0.40 seconds. And so hence t of the 0 0.50 time would be 0 0.90 seconds. Okay, so that's how you get it in the event that you're using a stopwatch and it has a lap function that's doing this. So that basically explains how I got this column in the table. These other columns, I basically repeated the procedure. This last one, I found the average times. So how did I do that? Well, I have five different times, so I basically used T average AVG is equal to one-fifth of T1 plus T2 plus T3 plus T4 plus T5. So for example to get the average T average at 0 0.50 meters what I have is just reading off from that table, T1 is 0 0.90 seconds, T2 is 0 0.79 seconds, T3 is 0 0.67 seconds, T4 is 0 0.80 seconds, T5 was 0 0.89 seconds, so how do we get the average time? Well, one way of expressing an average time is to put a bar over the T. So we have T bar of the 0 0.50 meter position. And we basically go one fifth of and we plug these guys in. These are the individual times. T1 was 0.9, T2 was 0.79, T3 was 0.67, T4 was 0.8, T5 was 0.89. So we're going to plug those guys in. So let's go ahead and bring out the calculator. We have 0.9 plus 0.79 plus 0.67 plus 0.80 plus 0.89, that gives us 4.05. So we need to then divide that by a fifth, since there were five times going into that, and we get 0.81, which as you can see is the time that I've recorded in the average time at 0 0.50 seconds, uh, 0 0.50 meters. So here's the 0.81, and that is for the 
position of 0 0.50. All right, so you repeat that for all the other positions you have. Then our next step is that we need to make a graph, which has distance versus time using the average times that we got for each position at each angle. So you're going to be making three different graphs. And the question is, what kind of graphs are you going to get? You could get a horizontal line. You could get a line with a positive slope. You could get a line with a negative slope. You could get a curve of some sort, like a parabola, etc. And at least one of these graphs is going to make a curve, which we hypothesize will be a parabola. So let's go ahead and plot the example data. Uh, first I'll do by hand, and then I'll show with the Excel spreadsheet. So I've plotted over, I've put over here in blue a abridged version, an abridged version of my table uh, with just position and average time. This is at 10 degrees again. And then I've labeled the axes on my graph. And so now I would basically go about plotting these points. So the first point was at 0, 0. The next one is at 0.25 comma 0.59. is roughly right here, very nearly 0.6. And then for the next point, I'm at 0.5 in the x, in the position direction, and I'm at 0.81, which would be right about here in the y position, and so on. So I'll go ahead and plot the rest of these. Basically, I get something that looks like this. And yes, at the very end here, I get what looks like maybe a straight line. But as you can see, if I were to draw a line of best fit through just these endpoints, that line would fall well short of the rest of these points. And any way that I try to draw a line of best fit, it's going to end up basically not being very linear. So the next best thing that I can do is say that it looks like it may be making some sort of a curve. And in fact, I might hypothesize that that curve is maybe a parabola. This is basically how I can free draw this curve without additional points. Um, so the next step then is to test and see whether this might be a parabola instead. So the way that we go about doing that is basically that I need to um, try squaring an axis. So to that end I've recreated the table here and I've added an additional column for capital T which is going to be defined as little t squared. So for the first point, I had 0, so that squared is still 0. For the next one, I have 0.59, and I want to square that, so I get 0.3481. For the next one, I had a 0.81 here, so 0.81 squared gives me 0.6561. Next one down, 0.97, so if I square that, I get 0 0.9409, and etc. So now I'm ready to try and plot this column versus this column. So I set my scale, then I start plotting points. So the first point, 0, 0, still here at the origin. Next point, 0 0.25, 0 0.3, roughly 0.35. So notice that on my scale, this is 0.8. So this is 0.2, this is 0.4. So we're basically going to be about right here, about three quarters of the way between this one and this one, and right on the 0.25 mark. Next one is 0.65, so we go up one, and here would be 0.6, so 0.65 is about a quarter of the way between this and this. Next one. 0.75 and 0.94. So 0.8, a 
this would be one. So we're looking at something like maybe about here and so on. So having made this plot, we see that this looks like it could hypothetically make a nice straight line. So we should use a ruler and draw a line of best fit for this. So here's our line of best fit. So uh, maybe I'll label it line of best fit. Anytime you get a line, you can write the equation y equals mx plus b, where y is whatever's on the y-axis and x is whatever's on the x-axis. So this would translate into x, because that's what's on the y-axis, equals m is the slope. So we'll just put slope times t. And notice plus b is the y-intercept. It's going through 0, 0. So this is plus 0. So the next step here is that we need to find the slope. <clears throat> and the way that we're going to do that is that we're going to pick two points that are actually on this line of best fit. Now these two points are not two data points. They're two points that are actually on the line of best fit. So I'm going to choose two points that are obviously not my data points. Here's one of them. It would be this point here where it's crossing through this corner. And so this point right here, this is 2.468. So we would have uh, 2.8 seconds squared comma, and this is 2.25 meters. And now we need to find another point that is not a data point. And looking th through this line, there's not a lot of great options here. I guess it kind of sort of crosses through this corner right here. This corner right here would represent the point uh, point 0.6, so 0 0.6 seconds squared, comma, this is 0 0.5 meters. So if I want to find the slope, slope is always rise over run. So that's change in the y divided by change in the x. So this would be 2.25. So let's uh, maybe color code it. 2.25 meters minus, uh, let's say, 0 0.5 meters. Then we're going to divide that by our run. So our run includes a 2.8 seconds squared. So 2.8 seconds squared minus and this one is 0 0.6, so 0 0.6 seconds squared. So you can put this into your calculator if you feel the need to do that. The top part, 0.25 minus 0.5, is going to give me 1.75 meters. The bottom part is going to give me 2.2 seconds squared. So now let's pull out the calculator. 1.75 divided by 2.2 .2, and that's 0.795 so our slope for this thing slope is approximately 0 0.795 meters per second squared probably we should round this off to uh, 0 0.8 meters per second squared, or maybe 0 0.80 on this scale. So I basically squared the time axis to get this line. So the answer down here would be time axis if I had a 10 degree thing here. 
And scrolling down, it says the slope of your line should be one half of the ball's acceleration in each case. So if I got this as my slope, I should be able to multiply this by two to get the acceleration. So my acceleration is about 1.6 meters per second squared. Again, basically we've said uh, if A represents acceleration, then A is equal to one half of the slope. M represents the slope. So therefore, uh, excuse me, the slope is one half of the acceleration. Therefore, this is the half. So therefore, A should be equal to 2 times M. So that's 2 times 0 0.8 meters per second squared. So A should be uh, 1.6 meters per second squared. This is our experimental value. So this is experiment. Then our instructions tell us that we can get the theoretical value for the slope of an object that just slides down a ramp by taking 9.8 meters per second squared and multiplying by the sine of theta. So remember that we had a ramp here that was at a 10 degree angle. So 10 and then we want to get the sine of that, so we push sine. So here's the sine of 10, and we multiply that by 9.8. And so I get 1.70. So theory, this we could say is like A experimental. A theoretical is equal to 9.80 meters per second squared times sine of 10 degrees because I have a 10 degree ramp. So this was 1.7 meters per second squared. Alright, so then there's one more thing that we've got to do here after that, which is that we want to basically get a percent error. So percent error should be because we're comparing the theoretical value back to the experimental value. It's basically going to be this difference between experiment and theory divided by, in this case, I'm going to say the experimental value because our theory is making a prediction, but our theory may not be accounting for everything. So I'd rather, in this case, compare it to the experimental value than the theoretical value. And it's also worth noting here that you should generally take an absolute value so you want to make it a positive number. So what this looks like here would be, uh, let me clear some workspace for myself. Uh, we have percent error is equal to experiment minus theory divided by experiment, take an absolute value, multiply by 100%. So the percent error for this particular experiment, we had an experimental value of 1.6 meters per second squared. We had a theoretical value of 1.7 meters per second squared. We're dividing that by 1.6 meters per second squared take an absolute value and that's times 100 percent. So the difference between these two obviously should be 0.1. So 0.1 which is 1.6 minus 1.7 with an absolute value divided by 1.6 and then that times 100 percent. So we got a 6.25 percent error for this experiment. So percent error equals 6.25%. My guess is that you're going to get a larger percent error for your experiment than what I got for mine. I actually used a very slippery ramp, 
So my ball did not exactly roll down the ramp without slipping. It kind of slipped and rolled. If you're using something like wood or PVC or what have you, your ball is probably going to roll down the, the ramp without much slipping. That means that you're actually going to get a larger percent error in your experiment. And basically this, we've basically finished out the instructions for this experiment. Having calculated these percent errors, you are done. You might want to go back and look at the data that you've collected and at your graph and see if you can't figure out where the ball is traveling fastest based on this data. You should have a common sense answer and that common sense answer should be correct. So good luck to you with that. There are of course some additional exercises that are optional in this experiment. Um, I'm not going to go over how to do them in this video because, again, they are optional. The one other thing that I was going to show here is that I mention here that I give you an Excel spreadsheet that you can use to do some of these calculations. So let's take a peek at that Excel spreadsheet. Here is the Excel spreadsheet that you will see when you open it up from the web. You'll notice that I have an angle. These are for one degree, here's for two, here's for four. You have in this sheet space to fill in the times for each of these. So for example, I'm going to just put some times in and watch what, what happens. So maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.12, 0 0.09, 0 0.09. 1.5 and 0 0.20. By the way, these times I'm entering should be obviously wrong to you because they are faster than the times that I had for the 10 degree ramp. You know that that shouldn't happen. You know that if the ball rolls down a really steep incline, it should go faster, not slower. So these times should actually, because we're at a more gradual ramp, these should be longer times. But you can see that it has basically taken an average time for me, so you don't have to do that if you're using this. It has determined what the square of the average time is, and it has determined what the square of the distance is. So, and then if you look over here, it's put a plot for that. So if I enter numbers for the rest of these, what will happen is that it will figure out what all the average times are for you. This one, of course, should be 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0. And what it will do is, ultimately, it's going to make a plot here. It'll move all these dots so that they make the correct plot for you. And it will make this plot and this plot for you. This is the distance squared versus time. This is the distance versus time squared plot. So ultimately, you'll end up getting a, a pair of plots, really a set of three plots. And what you do is this one maybe will be curved, maybe it won't. And for each one of these, you just look for which version of this gives you a line. Note that there's a legend over here. This is the one degree, so the square represents one degree. The diamond represents two degrees, the triangle represents four degrees. So you can basically enter your data here and it will calculate the averages, the squares of both time and distance for you and it'll make the graph for you. Down here there is some theory work that you have to do. Basically you can write in, for example, a length for the ramp. You can write in the total time that it took to get down the ramp, maybe 1.5 seconds, and you can put in the angle that you had this ramp at, 0.5 or whatever, and it calculates for you the theoretical average 
uh, acceleration, and this is in meters per second squared. And it actually also calculates for you the average speed going down the ramp. So you can play around with your ramp length and your ramp angle and your total time here. And you'll see if you put in just the ramp length and the total time, it'll calculate an average speed. You can try this for all three ramps and compare the average speeds. Down here, you basically just need to insert your experimental and theoretical values for acceleration. So I could put 1.6 here and I could put 1.7 here. And here it is calculating my percent error. It's not uh, taking an absolute value, so you'd have to do that afterwards. You can actually adjust that by adding in this line ABS for absolute value. And that is it. That's what this thing does. There's also this sample set of data which shows what these plots should look like as made by Excel. Uh, so here is the position versus average time. Note that it's curved. It's basically parabolic. And then down here we had position squared versus average time. It's not very linear as you can see. It's actually more curved. And here is position versus average time squared and you can see it's a line. And you can basically find the slope off of this line and so on. So that's it for today's uh, lab walkthrough video. I hope that you guys found this video helpful and that you find this lab fun. It may be a little bit of a long lab and you may have a little bit of trial and error at first to get the timing down. I would again recommend that you video uh, with your iPhone or with a video camera and play back in slow motion. If you have a, any smartphone that has a good video software, could probably do it. Most video cameras will do 32 frames a second or so, and so you can play back uh, slower motion that way. So good luck, and thanks for watching.